This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. The podcast features conversations with musicians and music industry professionals, all intended to help musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love. Make music. Hey, it's Robonzo. Thank you for tuning in. As a gigging musician and fan of live music, I love sharing my personal experience and the things I'm learning from other music artists and professionals. You can be privy to those learnings by joining the Unstarving Musician community. In the process, you'll be supporting this podcast and moi. Just go to unstarvingmusician.com to join. You'll get an email from me usually every 7 to 10 days with tips and insights, all intended to make your music journey a little better and brighter. And you'll also get a free gift from me, a small token of my appreciation for being part of the Rabanzo Nation. <laughs> Before I get on to today's guests, I want to mention a couple of podcasts that I think you should know about. One of them is the Say It Loud podcast, and there's a special reason I mention this. Well, there's a couple. One of my friends is uh, a co-producer of the podcast, but even more special, I was in recent episode number 51 while I was visiting Austin recently. The podcast features hosts from Austin's rock band Fair City Fire and local comedian Matt Jones. They get a little weird with a range of guests, including artists including involved rather in the Austin music scene. It's an honest look at being an independent musician done with a little whimsy. Check it out at faircityfire.com forward slash podcast and on Facebook at Say It Loud Podcast. The second one I want to mention is Gig Gab. It's a weekly podcast where two working musicians, also friends of mine, Dave Hamilton and Paul Kent, who've also been featured on this podcast, they talk about gear, gigs, music, and more. It is the podcast for working musicians. I was in episode 88 of this podcast back in 2016. We talk about my then somewhat new book, The Unstarving Musician's guide to getting paid gigs. Whew, I almost said podcast, but it was about a, it was about getting gigs. Check it out at giggabpodcast.com and on Facebook at giggabpodcast. All right, let's do this. Today's guest, you'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll call your therapist. That is straight from Lindsay White's bio, and I love it. We talk a wee bit about her lifelong anxiety, among other things. Also from her bio, she's an award-winning San Diego-based singer-songwriter who has earned recognition from the Tool Ride Bluegrass Festival, I hope I said that right, Kerrville Folk Festival, Guitar World, and American Songwriter Magazine. She's super passionate about her life, her past, loss, love, and the world around us. As I do in these conversations, we bounce around a bit uh, in a bit of the trivial for my own amusement, but we also discuss songwriting a songwriter's book club, her BFF, who is also her producer, festivals, touring smarter, side hustles, journaling, her first two albums recorded in 2010 and 2017, her forthcoming album, hopefully coming out in 2019, rebranding herself as a solo artist, having come from a well-known duo called The Lovebirds, and much more. She is a delightful person and crazy talented. Ah, dang, and I almost forgot. You are going to hear Lindsay's track called Surrogate from her latest album, Lights Out, at the end of this episode. You're in for a treat. All right, here's me and Lindsay White. Lindsay, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah, did my voice just suddenly change like I was on a podcast when I did that? No, <laughs> but I like... felt like mine did. I felt like my mine's like shot up an octave. <laughs> I felt like it did. I, I tr- transformed over to like professional voice. <laughs> <laughs> It's not just me. So thank you, by the way, for making time for me. It looks like you're pretty darn busy. Um, and I don't I don't think I um, shared the little story of discovering you, but I recently discovered, I think I found you in a San Diego Facebook music group, which I um, was trying for the first time. I, I, um, I joined that group and was trying something new for the first time. I wanted to just post that I had this episode for a local artist, which um, was Lee Coulter. And I thought, Mm -hmm. well, I should just kind of look through the group and, you know, see if there's anyone interesting in there. And I ran across you and I wasn't sure until tonight. I made, um, I did most of my sort of research this evening, but I, um, that day when I found you, I saw something about the lovebirds and I thought, oh, that sounds kind of familiar. And then tonight I Mm -hmm. made the connection. You played the first house concert for Amy and Gary Killingsworth, didn't you? I sure did. Yeah. <laughs> I love Amy and Gary. Yeah. They're really sweet people. I, um, well, I, I've never met Gary, but he sounds like a nice guy. Um, I interviewed Amy 
on the podcast, uh, a few of my guests had gathered that I was very fascinated with house concerts and, and, uh, she was mm-hmm. referred to me. So yeah, you, when we got into the history of it, um, your, I guess that was the duo, the lovebirds when it was, yeah. when you were doing that. Yeah. So she mentioned that and, um, anyway, yeah, made the connection. So that was kind of fun for me. That's the connection. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love her and I'm so glad that she has taken the, the whole house concert thing and really, um, expanded into making it this like incredible series and I'm just like I don't know I'm just very proud of them for for doing that because it's hard world out there for us songwriter folks and anytime someone just like latches onto that idea of house concerts and creates like a whole new venue it's just something that's great for the whole theme you know yeah and from all accounts it sounds like she's doing a world-class uh job of it too oh, yeah I gathered from, yeah. do you know Lisa Sanders, by the way? Yeah, I do. Um, one of your neighbors, I guess, but uh, she too, um, as you may know, knows Amy and is, has played there. Mm-hmm. And where was I going? Oh, um, I was going to say, where was I going with that? Lisa had mentioned to me, and I didn't gather this when I talked to Amy, that uh, Amy has a background as like an executive admin. I'm like, ah, that kind of makes sense because she really just goes into the de- details for the concerts, it sounds like. Oh yeah. She's on it. That's one of the things I love about her. She just is like on her game. (laughs) Sounds like it. So how, one thing I did not gather in looking at your work is how long have you been doing the, um, songwriter musician life thing? Um, (laughs) for money? (laughs) No, uh, I've, I've written, written songs and been kind of like dabbling in it since, you know, I was, 13, 14 years old, but it, I don't think I really started, um, going for it in terms of like performing, um, until I want to say probably around like 2006 or something. I moved down to San Diego to, uh, coach basketball at a junior college. And that sort of took up most of my time. I just thought I was going to become this basketball coach and music was just something I liked to do. And then once I coached for a season and kind of hit this crossroads of like, is this really what I want to do? Or did I just spend the last four years of my life, like chasing this thing that I wasn't really, um, into heart and soul. Um, that's kind of when I flipped the script and basketball became more of a hobby and music became more of a, um, career path. So, um, ever since then I've been doing it, you know, on the, I'm trying to do it full time, but, um, Unfortunately, original music doesn't necessarily um, bring in a lot of money. So just kind of had, have had day jobs, have had side jobs and just doing what I can to try to make it work. But it's been a good, you know, 10 plus years now. Yeah, I was going to say you've been doing it for quite a while. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. I noticed that on your, and not uncommon, I um, among, you know, my guests, uh, but I noticed that you looked like you had, uh, like a marketing kind of side hustle that you did. Um, uh-huh. are you, um, do you have something sort of regular that you're tied to outside of music for as far as work goes? Yeah. So for about 10 years, I worked, um, in, a, in corporate event planning and hmm. I kind of worked all over within that job, but, um, landed in, um, marketing and did that for a long time. And, just recently, I'd say maybe a little over a year ago, lost that job. And since then, I've been, in addition to doing like, you know, your typical cover gigs, you know, whether it be weddings or malls or <laughs> brunch cruises, whatever it is, um, I also try to freelance as um, more just like content management where it might be like, writing a blog for a certain client or doing content design or content creation. And I work with a couple different clients right now at the moment that um, are sort of holding it down for me in terms of hours. But um, yeah, I just kind of pieced together a bunch of different uh, side hustles as they call it uh, to try to make it all work. And actually I really enjoy it. I get to, you know, be my own boss, which, which is great, but the stability is not always as great as having, you know, your, your set nine to five job, but the flexibility is, is a lot more, um, beneficial when it, when it comes to like doing music, you can kind of like wrap your schedule around your music obligations. So in that sense, it's 
a really good change in my life that's happened only recently. Yeah, that's cool. I've, you know, I don't even know how many of my guests do something very similar or how many of them just flat out have a regular steady day job. And I, I know some of them that do have a regular job and then they are just, um, they're doing what they do musically at a really high level when they're not, you know, working and they're just kind of doing it, mm-hmm. um, spending their time writing and recording. And then I know there's many that I've not even asked, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that it's, um, stuff that you like. Uh, where did you coach basketball? Uh, Mesa College, Mesa Junior College. Okay. I Speaking yeah. of sports, I wanted to ask you, it looks like you uh, box or enjoy boxing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Um, just maybe two or three years ago now, I, I joined Title Boxing Club San Diego. And um, I mean, I don't box people or anything like that, but <laughs> I take, you know, <laughs> boxing classes and sometimes we'll work with the trainers to, you know, on like mitt work and stuff like that. And I, I really enjoy it ever since, um, when I kind of stopped coaching basketball, I, I tried to play rec leagues more at just as a hobby, but I ha- I've had back problems, knee problems all my life since I've been playing basketball since I was a little girl. And, um, it just kind of became, became too, um, intense physically. Like I was, I was going down a road of like, you're going to hurt yourself and for what, you know? So I like that boxing is, is not as high contact because you're just hitting a bag. You're going at your own pace, but it's still got that like level of intensity that I need in a sport. So it's been a, a saving grace to say the least ever since I stopped playing basketball. Is that a weekly thing that you do with the classes? Um, I try to, I try to go daily. I mean, I don't always get to it, but I try to go, you know, three or four times a week. And if I'm not taking a class, I'm doing strength training or something like that. It helps keep me sane. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. And then I know I'm going to get to music, but (laughs) (laughs) you're like, what else do you do in your life besides music? (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Well, um, there was something else that caught my eye and I'll tell you why in a second, but, um, I saw you had a recent post that said you love house sitting. Was that a one-off thing or is that something that you do sometimes as well? I'm just the queen of the side hustle, you know? So <laughs> I've, I've gotten into some, some weird, I mean, not weird house sitting's not weird, but just now that I do have a little bit more flexible of a schedule of somebody, it's usually like a friend of a friend type referral thing. If somebody wants me to watch their house and feed their pets, I'll do that. If somebody wants me to watch their kid I'll do that I actually got into nannying too right after I lost my job the timing just kind of worked out with one of my friends and they needed um somebody to take over when they were done with their maternity leave and um the timing just worked out so I nannied for the first time last year and then totally fell in love with that and have you know gotten requests ever since to to do temporary nanny gigs here and there so yeah really I just don't say no to things <laughs> when it comes to an opportunity to make a little bit of money on the side <laughs> yeah I, I asked because um, so I don't know if you gathered but I live in uh, Panama which I guess is somewhat irrelevant but um, <laughs> well, well, my wife and I have a, a dog and a cat. Might as well be a couple. Of, well, no, I, was, I guess I couldn't do this if it was kids, but um, <laughs> they kind of require some attention when we travel. And so we get, uh, mm-hmm. we'll have house sitters um, come. And we just did one of those gigs and I saw that. And I was like, oh, I wonder if you do the like traveling around and do house sitting and like somehow squeeze in your gigs. But it's a little bit more of a local thing, it sounds like. Yeah, a little bit more local. It's just nice. Um, We live in a very small house. We have a roommate. And um, so it's nice sometimes for my wife and I to just like have a regular sized house to kind of sprawl out in. And usually whoever we're watching the house for says, go ahead and do your laundry. So we're like, yes, free laundry. I just feel like (laughs) such a teenager. Like, And I'm like, oh, a real life adult couple asked me to watch their house. I feel like such a grown up now. (laughs) It's a good feeling. It's always fun. So I was watching a video that you did for or with or at the right room for Deep Uh Deep Dark Down. Is that the name of the track? Uh Uh-huh. Great video, by the way. Um, Thank you. you. Can you talk a little bit about how that whole thing came about and also the the guy that's playing with you in the video? Um, How the video recording came about or how the song came about? Yeah, yeah, the opportunity to do it. It's a really great Uh, song and and the um, video is cool. 
Well, I had come across the Rye Rooms, um, the Rye Room Sessions videos online and just um, a few of artists that I've known or seen in passing just through various tours and festivals, things like that. Um, I've seen them put out these really great videos through this Rye Room session. So I was like, what the heck is this all about? And contacted them, sent them some samples. And um, you basically just uh, send them your stuff. And, and if they like it, they're like, okay, let's schedule a time to record. And uh, you do pay for the services, which I'll say is a, a really, um, let's say, worthwhile fee, I think, for what you get because they also premiere um, the, the song and everything nowadays is about visual content. Everybody wants to see what you look like live before they book you. So it's just like a really um, worthwhile investment, I would say. And yeah, so we just kind of were emailing back and forth and they're based in Portland and um, scheduled a day and tried to schedule a house concert around that weekend. So I would also have some money coming in for that um, trip and ask my, that's my producer, Alex, in the video. Uh, he operates a studio called Studio Studios. <laughs> I just said the word studio a lot, but um, <laughs> he came with me and um, that's kind of like, my little recording duo. He's like my BFF when it comes to recording music because he's a multi-instrumentalist. He's an excellent, excellent producer. And I just knew that if I was going to have something um, like that online, I would want him to be a part of it because um, he just adds this extra layer of texture, you know? So when I can afford to bring him with me, I definitely try to. That's cool. It is a great video and not, not the story I was um, expecting, but um, not an unfamiliar one. I um, was just thinking of a guy I had on the podcast not too long ago who, whose music career is rather young. Um, and uh, he was, you know, he just started writing um, for himself really. And then he submitted to, um, I don't know if it was the Dripping Springs music, but no, it was probably one in Alabama somewhere, pretty big one though, mm-hmm. and submitted an iPhone demo. <laughs> they accepted him, but anyway, yours was a little different than mm-hmm. that. But you just basically submitted something, <laughs> and they had you on. That's nice. Um, nice compliment. Um, bear with me just a second. I think I just uh, unplugged my uh, laptop, and I don't think I want to do that. Okay. Um, and then did uh, it, do you said your producer's name is Alex? Yeah, his name is Alex Dausch. Did he work with you on both Lights Out and uh, the other album tracks? Yeah, so he did both of them. Um, and I've known him for a really, really long time. We actually lived together at one point. Um, and he recently just relocated to Minnesota. So we're trying oh. to figure out what our what our long-distance relationship is going to look like for my next album. Because we're about, I would say, a third of the way through it and um we're just gonna have to figure out um wait times for me to go back there and finish it up and ways to um work around that distance which i'm totally willing to do because i just love him so much but um yeah he did both of my both my albums so far um you'll be traveling to minnesota to do a lot of the work is that what you were just saying probably we recorded uh, the majority of the scratch track so he can do a lot of the production um remotely you know just with me emailing or facetiming or whatever and we can kind of that's kind of how we work together anyway we just collaborate on ideas what are we here for this what are we here for that and then he kind of lays down the additional parts um so it's really just about um doing the the takes of the vocals and making sure we have all that Right. So I'll just probably block out like a week or so in the coming months to go visit him, which I would do anyway, because he's like my best friend. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I, look, I just have to buy it like a really good coat. <laughs> yeah. How did you meet him? How did you guys meet? Um, Randomly through one of my old roommates was working on a film project for film school and had met Alex on Craigslist um, because he was just kind of putting himself out there as, as available to do music and work on creative projects. And that's right when I was getting started in the music scene here in San Diego. And I didn't know, you know, who was the first person to call when it came to recording my music. And 
my roommate was like, well, I just met this guy named Alex. You should talk to him. And the rest was pretty much history. So we've been working together all these years. That's cool. The the, the two albums, Tracks and Lights Out, I noticed, and I only listened to a little bit of Tracks, but um, the opening track and then uh, a few in um, personify a much different sounding album in that they're these kind of somewhat heavy elements to it are more um, like uh, maybe rock uh, kind of elements mm-hmm. to them that I did not hear on Lights Out. Uh, can you talk a little bit about mm-hmm. the the mood change or, or where, where sure. you were at as an artist at, in 2010 when you released Tracks versus the more recent one? Sure. Um, when I released Tracks, I was, uh, let's see, where was I in life? It was so long ago. <laughs> Life, mm-hmm. Lifetime ago. I was you know, younger, just kind of getting out of college, finding my footing. I think my parents were going through a divorce or something. Um, I was at the time of recording that album married to a man and just heard the tail end of, of that album, um, about when it was about ready to be released. That's kind of when I came out and, um, went through that whole transition of, realizing who the heck I actually was. <laughs> mm-hmm. So there was like a lot, to, a lot to sort out. I think I would call my head space during that time a little bit more, um, tumultuous, I guess, um, a little bit of feelings of anger and confusion and, and all that stuff. So I think that's why what came out ended up being a little bit more on the rock side, a little bit more bluesy. Um, there's still like a tiny bit of folk going on in there, but yeah, I I agree. The production is definitely, you know, ramped up a little bit. And I think that's just, um, demonstrative of where my head was at at the time. (laughs) And then for lights out, which just came out, um, last year, it was right after my mom died. And so I think I was dealing with a lot more grief at that time. And, um, I had come more into my, my own as a person and, and my identity issues were a little bit more sorted out, but as they related to my relationship with my mother and maybe some other things, um, having to do with, you know, my anxiety and, and stuff like that. So, so the result sort of ended up being more of a contemplative sound, I guess. Do um, so we, we talked a little bit about, or we both mentioned, I guess, rock and you mentioned blues and, um, you're certainly kind of genre fied as folk right now. Do you, do you see yourself staying in the kind of folk arena as far as your sound goes, or do you just wait and see where life takes you? Yeah, I've never really felt like any of those genres sort of, really explained what it is I sound like and that's fine. Mm-hmm, <laughs> I mm-hmm. know like the the different digital distributions and stores and radios, like they they need those labels to put people into categories and I understand sure. why they're useful. But for me it's it's like one song might sound one way and another might sound another and, and I might put them on the same album and oh well, you know, it's just the song sort of dictates what what it's going to sound like. And I'm, I'm more a lyrics first person. So I just try to, to respect the words of what I say with, with some type of music that makes sense for those words and, you know, don't really worry too much about the rest. So like on this album, for example, you have some songs sound kind of poppy, some songs sound kind of country and, you know, I'm not too worried about, how it all sounds together because I feel like the, the lyrics are what provide that spinal cord, if you will, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that, and I assume this kind of ties into your songwriting. So I'm still with music here, I think, but, uh, I noticed that you enjoy, uh, journaling, gratitude journaling specifically. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is that something you've been, like uh, the periods of time that we've been talking, talking about, uh, have you always done that or is it something more recent in your life that you've been doing? Um, it's been, I filled up one big book already and I'm on my way through a second one, but, um, that actually came about, I don't know if you are aware of Jeffrey Joe. Mm. 
he was a songwriter here in San Diego and um, one of one of my close friends. And we actually lost him last year. And he used, that's something he used to do every day on his Facebook. He would post his, his silly gratitudes and he would tag people that, you know, he's thankful for any given day. And um, it was just something I started doing in his honor. Um, it reminded me of him, made me feel close to him. And I had experienced a lot of loss in my life over the last couple of years. And it sort of just is a way to help me get out of those funks sometimes and be like, you know, you might be having X, Y, Z problem, but at least you have these basic things that you should be totally thankful for and not take for granted. So, uh, it's something that I like to do at night when I, before I go to bed, cause I tend to be a very high anxiety person. And those are the times of day where my brain really can, you know, be off to the races. So it kind of helps ground me and helps me take pause and realize that, You know, no matter if I've got a billion things going on and half of them aren't working out right, it's fine because, uh, you know, I have a place to sleep and I have people who love me and all that stuff. So, (laughs) yeah, I recommend it for everybody. (laughs) Yeah, uh, the pictures are wonderful. And uh, I I think I saw two series of journals and one of them, the more recent one, has some nice quotes on the left side and then you're, you're journaling on the right and then... Um, I believe I saw some earlier ones that were more the blank page uh, thing, mm-hmm. but they were both kind of fun to, to browse through. <laughs> um, and I, I asked about it to, um, you know, journaling is kind of you know, a constant topic of conversation around me and it's in, in my life and, and a lot of other things that you touched on um, uh, or that maybe I brought up, but um, gratitude and, and loss. And I'm sorry, by the way, about Jeffrey. I am. Glad no. to hear that. That sounds like you were kind of close, or at least someone that you really appreciated having around. But um, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it and it's funny that you mentioned that it's a nighttime thing that you do, and I've I've um, certainly read about this practice and and um, have tried it. I've been when I do journal, I've been more of a morning um, uh, journal person. So I was when I was mm-hmm. making a note about it, I thought I'm gonna ask you know just kind of curious if they're connected to any morning routines but before we even maybe before we started recording you had uh, mentioned that you just can't seem to get up too early because <laughs> we're talking about working out so. i'm just not there yet in the morning I, I need like my gallon of coffee before i can even start functioning <laughs> yeah. but i just i'm not as as uh anxiety prone in the morning i think i get up and i'm i'm ready to go and i'm ready to start checking things off the box. Whereas when I go to sleep, it's like all of a sudden my mind is in overdrive thinking about, you know, the world's problems and my problems and, you know, things I have control over, things I don't have control over. So it's a good way to just sort of slow that train down before I go to bed. Yeah. Are you a bit of a night owl? Um, I'm a bit of an insomniac. Yeah. For those reasons. Mm, But I have, I have my, things that I try here and there. I have like the oils and the the gratitude journal and, you know, just different things that I try, sleepy time tea, that kind of stuff. <laughs> and then when all else fails, the Xanax. <laughs> <laughs> the calm me down. Have you always had, um, I wasn't going to ask, but you mentioned it a couple of times, have you always um, uh, had an anxiety aspect to your personality or is it something more recent? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's been since I was, I don't know, five. <laughs> and now, now that I have words to, to identify what it was back when I was younger, I just thought I was a crazy person. But, um, now that I kind of know how to see it, then it's a little bit easier to, to manage. But I do get that question a lot being a musician, people equate anxiety to something like stage fright, which is not necessarily this Well, for me, at least not how it manifests itself. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So anxiety for me is just something that um, it's it's like either negative self-talk or, or just like this uncontrollable feeling that you're going to die or that there's just so much pressure, like the weight of the world is on you. And um, sometimes that just kind of comes out of nowhere at just like the most random time. So it's definitely been a struggle to um, to figure out how to exist in the same, um, place as that at any given time. I don't, it's, it's definitely been a dominant theme of my personality for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I understand. I, um, I, I wouldn't say that I have a, it's like a huge thing for me, but I certainly have a lot of, I like to say, um, you know, the voices in my head and, uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of a recurring um, thing of, uh, discussion with, with, among my guests and, you know, my wife's always saying that artists, uh, s- seem to have a propensity for, um, what do you call them? Uh, emotional or, you know, mental health challenges, whatever we, <laughs> we label them. And, and I have talked to a few artists about different, you know, varying degrees and types of, of challenges that they have. And, um, anyway, yeah, thanks for sharing that. I, I assume it's helpful for others just kind of hear that, um, you know, that, uh, you and people like you or me or whoever work, you know, uh, are challenged by these things and how we kind of work through them. So, um, another Certainly. random, th- I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just agreed with you. I just, I think it's important to talk about and, and, you know, if, if there's some people out there that hear a song that has to do with those themes and feels like a like an ounce better about themselves, like that is definitely rewarding for me. Yeah, for sure. Another random thing, D, uh, I saw in one of your gratitude journals that you had um, Japanese beer listed as something you were thankful for. Is that something that you're just really into, or is it something that you just happened to like that week, maybe? <laughs> I think it was that day I went to go see a band at a, at a sushi restaurant, and yeah. I hadn't had Japanese beer in a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was just something fun. Um, I did want to ask you about, so you grew up in California, an area called, I'm going to mispronounce it, how do you say it? <laughs> Corcoran. Corcoran, thank you. Not mm-hmm. too far away from that, I guess, it, um, is that Kings County? Is that the name of the county there? Yeah, Kings County. Is that where the Kings Canyon area, which appears to be not terribly far away from you, got its name, or the county got its name? Um, I'm not exactly sure. I'm a bad central Californian. I don't know my <laughs> my names and my histories very well. <laughs> well, I was kind of... Um, we, we do have a prison. That's, that's what we're known for in Corcoran is a big maximum security prison. We had Charles Manson while he was alive, and uh, we are also a big farming town. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I saw the prison on the map. Um, I didn't realize Charles Manson was there, but I also noticed, I was just kind of trying to see where it was and, and notice, um, Kings Canyon and Sequoia, which caught my eye because, um, so I grew up in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I was born in Fort Worth and met Mm -hmm. my my wife the old fashioned way at a bar in Arlington, uh, Texas, Mm -hmm. but we, we lived there together for um, quite a while, but we, we started vacationing in California and would always go to Sequoia National Forest, so not terribly far away from where you are, and uh, those trips kind of drew us to California. We ended up living in Northern California, but anyway, when did you find yourself in San Diego? Um, well, after high school, I went to LA for college. I went to Occidental College in Eagle Rock, okay. and then um, that's where I played basketball and when I was about to graduate, I just started applying for coaching jobs and, um, Mace college was the first one that got back to me and said they had an opening for an assistant. So I just made my way down here and, um, it worked out just because my boyfriend at the time was, uh, he went to San Diego state. And so he already had, um, friends and a living situation sort of set up for us down there. So it was my next natural move, I guess you would say. And I'm so glad I did it. I I love San Diego. Yeah. It's a really uh, cool town. I've been a few times. I um, would like very much and and will at some point go back. Did, uh, was Mm -hmm. music ever part of your education in school? Um, I took classes here and there, but again, just because basketball was my main focus, it was sort of hard to, um, decide I, I basically picked one I picked sports you know because mm-hmm. a lot of the classes and necessary requirements for a music major um involved concerts and classes and lessons and whatnot that took place sort of during the same times as practice and while there were people in my school who did somehow manage to do both I just was like that's way too much for me I would rather just you know, take music classes here and there when I can and, and devote most of my time to basketball. Do I regret that? Mm, kind of, <laughs> but you know, I, I can't go back and change it. So I'm happy with, with what I did, but, um, 
I, I really actually, when I moved to San Diego, I started meeting a lot of people in the music therapy field and I really was kind of slapping myself that I didn't know that was an available college major that, that one could major in something like music therapy. And I, that's something that I always kind of wish that would have been available information for me back when I was picking and choosing where I was going to go and what I was going to study, because that was kind of like right up my alley and I didn't even know it existed. (laughs) Is that something that still interests you today? Um, yeah, I mean, I just have so many friends here in San Diego that do that, that, um, I just think it's like a really, really cool field of study that, you know, using music to achieve non music goals is just pretty amazing (laughs) when you're thinking about it in terms of, uh, being a songwriter and always looking for ways to use this, you know, random musical gift you have to, to generate income for yourself. I'm like, dang, (laughs) that would have been that would have been a great way to go, but maybe one of these days, who knows, I, I might go back and pursue it. We'll see. Yeah, it's no, I was going to say, it's never too late, Lindsay. <laughs> never too late. Yeah, all you have is time. That's what my mother-in-law always says. <laughs> um, so t- tell me about the upcoming album. You you said that you're, um, you've done all the scratch tracks, and uh, did, I, did you say that you're going to try and put it out this year? Um, probably not this year. I'm sorry. It's almost over. Why would I say such a thing? (laughs) (laughs) But I am, I'm actually considering the idea of putting out either a single or an EP before I put out a whole other full length record. Um, just in the interest of this predicament that I'm in now where I have a long distance relationship producer. Um, I have some songs that are more near the ready to go. Um, part of the gate, whereas others are, we're just kind of starting out. So I'm kind of dabbling with the idea of, of releasing a single or an AP first. Um, so we'll see what happens. I, I don't know. I don't even know. <laughs> hmm. I think you should, for what it's worth, just having talked to a number of other artists and, um, um singer songwriter artists, uh, I think it would be great. And, and I'm sure your fans would love it. Love it too. What, what's the, um, where are you at with, uh, you know, kind of your life mood, uh, in terms of the album? Where's, where are you coming from on this album? Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so my, my issue with recording is I write just so much faster than I can afford to record or put out music. So mm-hmm. what I, I get myself into these pickles where I have these songs that are sort of, you know, waiting for their day in the sun. Meanwhile, I'm writing 25 other songs. So, um, it always ends up being a surprise to me once I actually put out a collection of work, what ends up making it on the record. Like with lights out, I started with completely different songs and then ended up with what you have. And that would just sort of morphed around what was going on in my life at the time with my mom dying and, and that whole thing. So, um, it just sort of chose itself, if that makes sense. So I'm kind of not trying to put too much pressure on myself to have a basic idea for, for what this one's going to be thematically, but I I've moved forward in my grieving to the point where I think I'm starting to see time as more of a ally something that can give you a little bit more of um, hope and perspective and healing. Whereas in my last record, you know, I was seeing it as more of a thief, something that would take people away from you and, you know, put you into this, these positions of despair and hopelessness. So I'm happy to say that I've, you know, kind of come out the other end on a more, positive note but then at the same time with all that's going on in the in the world and government and politics today i can't help but write about you know these broad overarching themes of feminism and you know so i find i find myself writing from a frustrated um point of view as well so we'll see how it all Mm -hmm. you know comes out the gate together and I just kind of, I hope that I can maintain some sense of, um, sanity that I've, that I, and perspective that I've gleaned from going through all these hard times, you know, and 
realizing that life is so short and that we have to live every day to its fullest and try to be the best versions of ourselves as we can. That's kind of like a message that I find myself in on an individual level, but just from a broader scope, I, I am kind of turning into a raging feminist. So Mm -hmm. we'll we'll see (laughs) what happens there. Well, that's okay. Whatever, whatever drives you to, um, to do your work. Uh, so it sounds like you write a lot. How, how, yeah, how often are you writing songs or what's your, um, I guess, in, in terms of the writing routine, is it, uh, is that a daily thing or a weekly thing? And how, how many songs are you kind of putting together on a weekly basis or a monthly basis? Um, I would say I probably write like two or three songs a month. I mean, give or take, you know, um, and in some, in some ways it just comes to me and I feel this urge where I just have to kind of sit down and let it come and do its thing where I don't really have too much of a say in the process of it. It's just a matter of finding the time to sit down and take these swirling ideas out of the air and put them into music. Um, and then other times it's more prompt driven. So I'm a part of the songwriting book club. Um, and we meet, I don't know, every month or two, um, and, we select a book and everybody writes their own song um, inspired by this book. And you don't necessarily even have to read the book. You could just really open up a page and find a sentence you like. It doesn't really matter. But um, that's kind of driven me as well to, to keep my songwriting chops up. And I've really enjoyed participating in that just because it, it kind of allows me to, to approach a song from a different angle, even though it generally ends up being thematically still about something that um, I'm going through or my own perspective on how I'm interpreting that work of art. But um, it's just a cool way to get outside my head and then like re-enter it. (laughs) So I've really enjoyed that too. How many people are in that group? Um, I don't know. I would say that there are about 10 ish active members that, that try to meet up on a regular basis. It's a really cool, really cool thing. And uh, the meetings are face to face, in person. Yeah, yeah. So we, in we come over to, yeah, we come over. We bring our guitars. We eat food. We listen to each other's songs, and we kind of have like a, a book discussion, of different prompts and questions about the book. But mostly, it's just to to gather and play these songs that we've written for each other. And sometimes it's cool. We like we'll contact the author and. Um, a couple of times we've had success reaching the author and like the author will, you know, feel flattered that we all sat down and, and did this in honor of their work. So I just think, you know, art inspired by art is, is a really cool way to connect with people. Yeah. And who, who organized that originally or how long has it been going on? Um, it's my, my friend here in San Diego, her name's Unison. Uh, she's the one who started the San Diego group, but I think the original idea was started up in Seattle and I'm not exactly sure on the name of the person who, st- who started it, but there should be one in every town. <laughs> yeah. It's a neat idea. Um, I somewhat recently, um, accidentally discovered a songwriting group and they actually, they call it, they might call it a, um, no, I don't think they call it Songwriters University, but they've um, kind of set themselves up on like in a, um, like semesters, which is where the whole, you know, university thing came into my head mm-hmm. from. And there's a lot of people in it. And they, um, the requirement is, is you have to submit some recorded work uh, every week while, while you're in it. Mm-hmm. And, and the group critiques, you know, for you and the quality of the recording doesn't matter. Um, I understand, mm-hmm. and uh, I think it's it's all um, you know, kind of online um, collaboration and and um, meeting and and critique, and that sounds really cool, though. Um, I think um, it sounds like it's been going on several years, and this one's based in Austin. Um, yeah, I used to be in another one, um, just some Facebook friends and connections that I had met here and there through tours and festivals, and just songwriters that I knew 
across the country and was invited to be a, a part of one that um, we shared every Tuesday. So it was like, no matter what, it could be a piece of crap. It could be the best thing you ever wrote, but every Tuesday you were supposed to submit something. And the idea would be that we would listen to each other's and critique each other's as well. And I think you got like one pass every month just because, you know, life gets crazy, but mm. it was definitely, um, the once a week thing is, is a whole different ball game in terms of pressure, <laughs> mm-hmm. but, um, especially just, I don't, I don't know that, that particular group, the, the caliber of, of songwriters in that group, I just felt like I had no business being a part of it. So I was just <laughs> always like scared to death that I was just submitting straight up garbage, <laughs> but, um, everybody was always really nice and, and supportive. And it's just, it's just good to surround yourself with people who, who care about it as much as you do, because not everybody in the world thinks of it as as this like life or death thing you know like songwriters do like so it's nice to to find your community for sure yeah yeah i mean it it sounds like a a form of mastermind which is a, a really neat thing for a group of people who have some sort of common thing goal or objective mm-hmm. so yeah i think it, it sounds wonderful you mentioned festivals and i i noted that you have participated in a few and some of them that I was familiar with and they all looked kind of noteworthy. Maybe some of them weren't so much that you've been in, but do you have plans um, or do you have any festivals uh, on the schedule right now? Do you have plans to do any in the coming year? Um, I would love to. I don't know that I have any on the schedule as of now, but yeah, I'm trying to get more into festivals and uh, house concerts. That's sort of my my goal for the the coming year is to just really hone in on um, ty- the, the right kinds of festivals anyways, like folk festivals. And mm-hmm. um, I did participate in different festivals and conferences, mostly with the lovebirds when I was um, part of that duo. And we, we had a great time doing that. We, and we were involved in some of the, I don't know if you've heard of folk Alliance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we've showcased at a few different Folk Alliance festivals. We participated in the Kerrville Folk Festival, um, other things here and there. And that's definitely something that I want to get more involved with. I feel like I kind of took a couple steps back when I started doing solo songwriting again, because now I'm Lindsay White and maybe people haven't heard of Lindsay White, but they've heard of the Lovebirds and, you know, it, it's it's been a lesson for me and and tenacity because there's been a little bit of frustration there of like, well, I'm the same person, <laughs> but maybe not um, getting the same opportunities and for whatever reason. And it's just um, my wife always reminds me like, you just have to be patient. Like it's like starting over again. So um, I'm really hoping to just kick down those doors, however. I can. And, um, a lot of it's just about relationships. So just trying to be involved in, in the different conferences whenever I can and, and meet the right people and hopefully have enough people who are influential in that world vouch for me. And that's kind of how you get the ball rolling because, um, those performance slots are so coveted and there's so much talent out there, you know, that it, it can get a little, competitive but that's not going to stop me sir <laughs> <laughs> nor should it you know i've heard um more than one story from talking to to people for the podcast that uh just through networking and playing with other artists as you do that um you know one of them's doing uh, or is, is is embedded or has become embedded in the festival scene and tells the other one or encourages the other one hey you should um you should check you know, this festival out or, or refers them or whatever. So, um, mm-hmm. there's that. And then, um, obviously just, you know, doing the submissions or whatever it is that you have to do to, um, mm-hmm. to, to put it out there and, and, uh, be at the mm-hmm. conferences, like you said, and maybe, mm-hmm. um, carrying the lovebirds history with you as, as much as you can would be a good thing until, um, you know, your name totally. just completely eclipses. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm very, I mean, I'm, I'm so proud of, of what we did together and, um, uh, and met so many wonderful people in that world. And I just, I hope to continue to do that, um, now as a solo artist and, and it'll happen. I just have to 
not be impatient and, and, you know, try to ask for help where I can find it and just stay on my game. It's easy to get discouraged when you're, when you're sort of by yourself, you know, because you only have yourself to rely on, but in some ways it's, it's good for someone like me because I am a little bit like of a control freak. So I can just, I definitely just hone in and hold myself accountable. And I say like, okay, Lindsay, here are the things that you have to do. Like just keep going for it and and it'll eventually happen. And, and that's pretty much what the life of a performing songwriter is all about is just moving forward, not taking no for an answer. And when you do hear the word, no, just keep going, you know, not everybody, likes every flavor and you just have to find the people that like your flavor. Well, yeah. I mean, when I listen to your work though, you, you definitely seem to have the right sound for that, that scene. Um, certainly based on your, your last album lights out. <clears throat> so I'm sure you'll have some, some success soon. Uh, you know, so many hours mm-hmm. in the day and so many days in the week, <laughs> one bite at a time <laughs> and I know you'll get there. So that's great. I'm glad to hear Thank that. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate it. Well, um, our time has gone by super fast. Uh, what else do I want to ask yeah. you? <laughs> are, are you, have you been touring lately or are you thinking about doing any touring outside of, um, doing festivals or are festivals going to be the big focus? I just got back from a, a cross country one. So I went, I drove all the way to Maine and back <laughs> for the first time as a solo artist. And that was definitely, um, so much fun. I had such a good time and got to play a lot of cool shows and, um, yeah, I think um, it's just always a matter of, like, what can you afford and and that whole thing. So now I'm in sort of, like, hibernate and recover and save money mode again. And once I think I put out um, new music, I'll probably get back on that train of touring. But um, I like to do um, weekend warrior type stuff where, let's say, somebody books me for a house concert in Texas on a Saturday, I'll try to put together like a little mini tour around that just to recoup some of the expenses. And, um, that's a nice way to do it just because you don't have to, you know, uproot your whole life for a month and, um, get into the money pit that is traveling everywhere, especially from San Diego, because, you know, if you're somewhere like Nashville, you can kind of go on, on these tours and, and, you have, you, you have your home base, which is not too far from everything else. And San Diego, you're kind of just starting <laughs> at the lowest, furthest point of the country and have to, you know, really dip into your finances to, to make it all work. So I'm trying to figure out ways to tour smarter. <laughs> that makes sense to me. And I can completely relate just because of the, the time that I was playing a lot it was always weekend warrior kind of stuff i wasn't even touring either but mm-hmm. i can completely relate and it makes a lot of sense given your um situation so yeah mm-hmm. i like that i like that well i wish you a ton of success in the coming year when do you, you when do you think the new album's gonna be out maybe <laughs> oh man i don't know i don't know i don't want to say because then i will feel so much pressure to have it done by then <laughs> but I, let's <laughs> say definitely sometime in 2019 <laughs> hey that's good enough well i look forward to hearing it i love um lights out and i Thank uh, you. like i said i just sort of previewed uh tr- tracks is it plural did i get it right um uh-huh. I, I just kind of previewed that one and i'm interested to hear that as well and i wish you a lot of success in um hooking up with some more festivals and house concerts and doing smart tours and and finding whatever side hustles make you happy (laughs) (laughs) um and tell me uh tell the listeners um right in front of me oh but i do so it looks like lindsaywhitemusic.com is the best place for Mm -hmm. people to find out everything about you and it's lindsay l-a-n-d-s-a-y um, yeah, so they can find out everything about you there. And it looks like your music is available where just about anyone wants to buy or stream digital stuff. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Yep. I'm everywhere. <laughs> cool. Well, Lindsay, I, I encourage a little light stalking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I did. Lindsay, I, I really appreciate, um, your time. It's been a real pleasure talking with you and I hope to talk with you again soon. Thanks. I'm, I'm happy you invited me to be a part of your podcast. Yeah, the pleasure was all mine. We'll talk soon. Take care. You're the 
sugar cold on a bitter pill. You're the place I go when an earthquake drill. You will walk to the porch with the bed in your hand, so I don't have to look at the boogeyman. You flash all of the light underneath my bed, and the monsters have not found me. Hey, thanks again for listening. Find links to just about everything covered in this episode in the show notes at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash podcast. This episode was powered by the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth Over and Over Again, available in paperback, on Kindle, and for most ebook readers at places like Barnes & Noble, Kobo.com, Apple Books, and just about anywhere else you might find ebooks. It's also available as a standalone podcast called the Unstarving Musician's Guide podcast. You can learn more about the book and companion podcast at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book. I'd love it if you picked up a copy, and I'd love it even more if you left a review. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell.